You might be wondering why there's such an emphasis on grace when we're looking at spiritual gifts. And the answer is this, that gifts are grace. And grace is a gift. It's the same thing really, just manifested in different ways through different people. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But, you know, we have lived through lots of different um, churches and experiences and um, crazy things and not so crazy things. And we all have a tendency to base what we understand through the grid of our experience. Um, For an example, from my background, um, we've gone through, well, we've seen crazy things in churches, and so our automatic thinking ends up, when we hear some kind of word that is associated with that um, wrong teaching or wrong experience, we want to qualify everything so that, you know, that we make sure we're not going down that line. Um, And we're very much on our guard and that's just one ex- one example so you can actually take that if you come from a church that teaches that grace means that God's not worried about your sin and or you come from a church that's taught that God's grace means he doesn't want to save everybody every time you hear that word you start to think about that but we need to base what we believe on scripture not there's three things that we've got to be careful not to base our belief on. One, we're not to base our belief on experience, even if the experience has benefited us. We can't base our belief on that. If, if we were to base our belief on that, we would be like, you just read the, hin- the Hindu notices in the paper. I went to this guru, this guru has helped me, now I've got a job, and now I've got this, now I've got that. And if that story is genuine, then if you had to base your belief solely on experience, you'd have to well say, well, that's... Well, that's a genuine experience. That must be true. The second thing we don't base our experiences on is our, oh, sorry, our belief on is a lack of experience. Because we haven't experienced something doesn't mean that thing is wrong or is not from God. And the third thing we don't base our belief on is on bad experience. Because we've experienced an abuse of leadership. We don't go to the other extreme of having no leadership. We've got to base what we believe on Scripture. Scripture is the barometer of everything. So we're going to look at this thing of gifts in three parts. One, we're going to introduce them. Second, we're going to look at Romans chapter 12. And then we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There are two lists of gifts. One in one Romans 12, one in Corinthians 12. There's also a list in Ephesians 4, but we've already looked at that. So I just want to introduce it by looking at how Paul introduces this thing of spiritual gifts. And remember, we're going through a whole series on God's vision for the church. And there are four things that we've been going through for quite a while. Doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And we're up to fellowship. And this is the last session we're going to look at fellowship. And fellowship means interactive participation and sharing. And how do we do that? By exercising spiritual gifts. That's one of the ways we do that. In fact, according to Paul, the primary way of doing it is by exercising spiritual gifts. Why? Why does it have to be spiritual gifts that allows us to fellowship? Because we can only biblically fellowship and biblically impart that which we have received. And that's the thing right now, the heart of the gift And this whole thing of spiritual gifts is the word receive. These are gifts. They say nothing about you. They say nothing about how holy you are or how spiritual you are. It is a free grace working of God in your life for the benefit of others. That's basically what gifts are. I hope, you know, there's one day I was in this building and someone walked in and I don't know if they had to... They had a, I can't remember if they had a question or they were needed to look at the meter. But he looked at the wall and he said, Oh, I see you are a charismatic church. And I said, What makes you think that? He says, I see the instruments are to the side and I see the posters on the wall. I said, Well, we just, hopefully, we are just people that are 
following the Bible. But actually, the more I think about it, we're supposed to be a charismatic church. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be a Baptist church. We believe in believers' baptism. We're supposed to be a holiness church. We're supposed to be a Presbyterian church, meaning a leadership of elders. Not according to how these things have manifested in churches and these labels, not according to the connotations people put on these labels, but according to what they biblically mean. Look what he says in Romans 12, verse 3. He says this, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think high, more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. I love how he starts that. He says, for the, through the grace given to me. Paul is functioning according to what God has given him to do. Paul doesn't extend himself beyond what God has given him. Neither does he minimize God's ability to work in his life. And there's are two areas that we have to be careful of. One is to think I'm the center of everything and without me nothing will happen. That's the danger. Because God has given me a sphere. And that means that God's gifted me in certain areas and given me a certain ministry, but that doesn't mean that that's all that matters. There are other gifts outside of what God has given for me to do and to say and to act that are just as necessary in the body. And so just because I don't have something to say about it doesn't mean it's, impo- it's not important. But the opposite is also danger. God's grace enables God's will to be accomplished. So if God had to desire that through someone here, they would go up to someone and say, be healed in Jesus' name, and that person who maybe was lame or whatever now begins to walk, we must never turn around and say, God could never do that through me. Why? Because it is God's grace. We have to make sure that we are in tune with God. Basically it. Because God can do anything he likes in accordance with his character and nature. God can do anything he likes according to his word. Paul does not go beyond the grace that God's given him. And so now Paul is telling people, take heed to this, because I'm not saying this from me, I'm saying this from the Lord. It's from, through, by the grace he's given to me, I'm saying this. In other words, you can't give out what you haven't taken in. We can't give, take, give out what we haven't taken in. We have to receive before we can give. That's why here in this, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and gave his son for a propitiation for our sins. And because God forgave the slave for his enormous debt, therefore the slave was to forgive the other slave for the lesser debt. It all starts with what God does. And what we do is a response to him. And therefore we have nothing to boast of. Look what he says. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Don't think too high thoughts about yourself. I'm not the one who has to say everything or do everything. God has given me a ministry. So let's look at this. As God has allotted to each a measure of faith, and there's a debate what this term faith means, but this is the best way I understand this. Everybody's got faith, and our faith is in Jesus Christ. That's where we put our faith in, in him as a person. And our faith allows us to hear what he has to say, and to see some aspect of who he is. So if you had to take faith like a cake, and a cake made with lots of different elements, if I get a slice of that cake, I get to see certain things and certain things put in that cake on that side. But someone else who has another slice of cake might see some other ingredients there that have been put in there. And so our faith allows God to work through us according to his will in a particular way that brings out certain elements of his character and nature. 
And so if you have to put all those slices together, then you start to see what the whole cake looks like. And so it is with faith. We're given a measure of faith, a portion of faith. A, um, and that portion of faith must be rightly related to Jesus. I like, um, there's a pastor in the UK that um, the Lord used him in my life. And he, the first message I ever heard him preach and the last Sunday message I ever heard him preach was exactly the same. And, he's, and when I first heard him preach it, I was expecting the worst because the meeting was about vision. And I thought, uh-oh, this meeting is going to be, God's got a vision for your life. You need to grab the vision and everything. But this is what he said. I do believe God has a vision for everyone. But really, there's only one vision. And that's the vision of, that Isaiah saw of God on the throne. And every vision will flow from that vision. And when God gives you a vision, you must die to that, you will die to that vision. And then he will resurrect it so that the glory goes to him. It was amazing. But I love that thing of whatever vision, whatever God puts in us will flow from his sovereignty and the revelation of who he is. It's all about him. And so through faith, we perceive him, though we do not see him. We perceive what he says. We perceive his speaking to our heart. And we see something of who he is. And we're given a portion of faith that's related to the nature and the character of God. And so, look at this. It says in verse 4, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. So therefore... Being given a measure of that faith and seeing something of who God is and what is revealed of himself, even though there are general truths that are across the board for us all, such as God is holy, we have sinned, judgment of sin is death, Jesus died for our sin, he rose again, he's coming back, we trust in him and put our faith in him and he forgives us. Those truths are the same for everybody, but there are facets of God's character that 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 are emphasized in different people's testimonies. And when we put it all together, we see the whole thing. And so in order to see the whole thing, we need to embrace the idea of being part of the body. In other words, I'm not going to get there by myself. Because God has so planned it and purposed it from eternity that I would grow into maturity through fellowship. It's not that God can't cause me to be a mature person all by myself on a desert island. It's just he hasn't planned it that way and it's not what he's revealed in his word. That's God's desire. Therefore, even in countries where Christians are persecuted, it's illegal to meet together. What do they do? They meet together. They don't stop fellowshipping. They, in fact, need it all the more. And so for that fellowship and that bond and that relationship and that togetherness in Christ is so, so, so important that we, we dare not treat it flippantly or lightly. We are members of the one body, but look at what else it says here. I find this amazing. So in verse 5 it says, So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now that's, for me, I'd never looked at it that way before. That I've always known we've, we're part of the body. But he takes it down to the member level. He doesn't say, we're all part of the same body. He says, we are members of one another. Which means, I'm a member belonging to you. You're a member that belonging to me. And we belong to each other individually. It's on the individual level that Paul's pointing this out. And therefore, my contribution to the body is not to this generic body out there, this single entity, and I'm, I'm contributing something to the body. I'm contributing something to my brother Andre, and my brother Andre is contributing something to Mark, and Mark's contributing something to Les, and Les is contributing to something to, something to Derek. And so there's this, this movement in the body. The hand 
doesn't just belong to the body. The hand belongs to the foot, and the foot belongs to the arm, and the arm belongs to the leg, and the leg belongs to the, the chest, and the chest belongs to the face. It belongs to each other. All the members belong to one another. And so the member, the individual member, has significance. And I don't know if you've ever been in churches sometimes where all that matters is the church. And whether you're there or not, as long as you're contributing something to the church, you're really indispensable. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're there or not. And if you're not, if you, you do, if you're not pulling your weight, it really doesn't matter if you leave. You, 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 know, you, don't, you don't matter as an individual. It's almost like that communistic mindset that's pervaded so many things because we're so, we're so, so, um, we're so focused on the empire and building the empire in this name of like Good Hope Church or Fantastic Future Church, we've lost what church is about. You know the early church met in homes. That's the way they met. And they say, one of the commentators I read it said, even the biggest home could not could not house more than 40 people. So the way church worked in the, the time of the apostles was this. The church was a group of cells in a town. And the elders would basically cross-pollinate between these different assemblies. These people, people would send one person or a couple of people from this assembly to that one and onward and so forth and, and like this. And so when Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, he's probably writing to a few different households. The church in Rome, a few different households. What does that mean? It means this. You can't get lost in, um, what's the word, a a anonymity. And you can't get lost in the crowd. If you walk through that door, everybody notices because we're such a small group anyway. Which means in order for that body to function, Everybody's got to contribute. You know, if you've got a group of 500 people meeting together, not everybody can share. Not everybody can contribute. But when you're in a, a group of 30 people, 35 people, everybody can contribute. And that's the way God intended it. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a meeting of 500 people, to have a church service of 100 people. But what I'm saying is biblically, that's not church. Biblically, the smaller group is church. Because the church is the assembling of believers coming together, building one another up in the most holy faith. It's good to have big meetings. God uses it. But without the smaller groups, we're not experiencing biblical church, New Testament church. That's what I'm saying. And so here... Therefore, we know we belong to one another and we're to contribute to one another. Do you know if you have an itch on your face, your finger doesn't go, huh, your problem. Your finger comes and scratches it, right? And if you're sneezing, your hand doesn't go, I can't be bothered helping that nose out. No, your hand comes to your nose. And if you have to walk somewhere, because you've got to go for an eye operation. Your foot says, I don't need an operation. You're on your own, mate. There's an availability. Now, it's not always possible to do everything for everybody. We all have different lives. But what I'm saying is the heart desire needs to be there. The heart desire needs to be there. Um, and this is an invitation. I'm just saying this. I don't know if they found anyone, but anybody who can help... Um, Lee and Lorna out on Friday morning if you're free and available they could do with some help in, because they've got to move but if you're available we don't and saying that we don't expect people to do things for us we expect that if there's an opportunity to do something for a brother that we ourselves would so meet that need Love is never taken. Love can only be given. If it's taken and if it's forced, it's not love. And so here we see that there are different gifts in verse 6. We have different gifts 
that differ according to the grace given to us. And so now we're going to look at the gifts. We moved from introducing this thing of gifts into what these gifts are from verse 6 to verse 8. And I'm not going to touch on much on prophecy because we've looked at that. If you want the link, I can give it to you. It's on YouTube. And tongues, we're not going to look at tongues um, except to look at in the fact that it goes with interpretation. So let's look at this. We all have different gifts. Paul teaches that we are to be united, not uniform. We are not all to be the same, and we're not, expect, we're not to expect others to be like ourselves or ourselves to be like others. You know, and we have that self-righteous attitude, you know, like, I would never allow that to happen without doing something. Well, that might be your gift and your, the way God uses you, but if you're so hard on other people because they're not do, meeting that need that you meet, what you might find is that other person is going to be hard on you because you're not performing a function that they perform. We're all different. And so we to encourage each other not to manipulate each other. And so here it says, we all have different gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Each of them is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of literally the faith. So you can look at what we looked at prophecy, but I'll just summarize. Prophecy is giving God, the Holy Spirit, giving a specific message to us in a specific situation that is either warning about something to coming or drawing our attention to something that needs to be looked at now, either for challenge or for building up. It's not generic preaching. It's not just taking a text and preaching it. It is Holy Spirit speaking through. Just as we see in the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the seven churches, very specific instructions and very specific information that relates to them. But it has to be according to the proportion of the faith. And the faith in all of these is the teaching, the service, the... It's, it, it means this. It means one of two things. It means that when you prophesy, it has to be according to or be in the right relationship to the faith. In other words, it has to be according to the word of God. That, for me, gives me such liberty and freedom and helps me to relax just a little bit. Why? I don't have to worry when someone says, God told me to tell you. If I don't do this, am I disobeying God? I don't have to take that on board just like that. If they're, what they're saying contradicts this, this trumps that. And so therefore, we test prophecy, and we'll look at that in 1 Corinthians, but we test it. This, thus saith the Lord, is more weightier than any other, thus saith the Lord. This one stands supreme. It's got to be in accordance with Scripture. Prophecy that contradicts Scripture or that goes against Scripture is not from the Lord. But secondly, it's got to be in right, right relationship to what we have put our faith in concerning Jesus. In other words, according to what the Lord has put in me and according to what I have heard from him, that, that I am to speak. Because if it's not from him, then it's from myself, and therefore I'm prophesying from the imagination of my heart. Therefore, I don't have to prove anything. You know, if everybody in this assembly prophesied something, except for, say, let's pick on Andre, except for Andre, everybody's speaking something, except Andre. And Andre's like, God didn't tell me anything. So what does that mean? And, well, Andre didn't prophesy. He mustn't be a spiritual. No. It means the Holy Spirit so willed that all these people prophesied, but not Andre. It doesn't make Andre any less. God's saying, I've got something else to do through Andre at this time. Andre should never be in a position where he feels he's got to prove something to the rest. And so he kind of is going to make something up in order to say something. Secondly, if service in the serving, and that's deaconship, deaconship, when we looked at deaconship last week, you can look at it on YouTube, 
but it has to be according to the serving, the serving which God has given, not another. Paul didn't go into another person's territory when he preached the gospel. He sought to go to virgin territory because that was God's will for his life. So it is the same with deaconship. You may be a deacon for one task. Do that task diligently and happily and don't feel wronged if you're not going to be a deacon for another task. If teaching according to the teaching, I love what Jesus says in Romans 20, um, sorry, Matthew 28, verse 20 onwards. Or, um, he says, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, teaching them according to everything I've commanded you. You can only teach that which you've been taught. Then it says... Or he who exhorts in the exhortation. That word exhorts is the Greek word parakaleo, parakaleo. And it means calling to one side. Literally, that's what it means. But it signifies in the Bible, someone who comes and encourages and helps and brings comfort or can challenge the person to action. It means those things. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. He is the comforter. He's the helper. He's the one that draws alongside and convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So someone who has this gift of exhortation would take what was given in the message, the teaching, and say, guys, oh, now I'm starting to sound like Kevin. Guys, do you not understand? Look what he said. Someone who is at the gift of exhortation might not necessarily be a teacher, but the exhortation is no less a valuable part to the body than the teaching, because what good is the teaching if it's not going to be applied? Exhortation. But there's another side to exhortation, and it's the side of bringing comfort. And you see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You can turn there, write the scripture down, but I'm going to paraphrase it. Paul says, We were so down. We were despairing even of life. We wanted to die. But God comforted us in our distress. And the reason he comforted us is so that we could be a comfort to others. So if we are distressed, it is for your comfort. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort. Someone with this gift in that way will be someone who's gone through distress, heartbreak, and suffering. Generally speaking, we used to have a cell group in Loesburg, and um, one of the ladies there, she was called Kim, uh, not Kim, um, Gurley, Indian lady. And she was introduced as, she's the comforter, you know, not the comforter, but she's the person with the gift of encouragement. And I said to her, rather boldly, but I said, you must have gone through a lot of suffering in your life. And she looked surprised and she said, yes, I have. And she shared some of those experiences. And she's gone through some hectic things. But here's the thing. Each one of us are able to bring comfort. The Holy Spirit can use each one of us to do that. But there's something three-dimensional about someone who's gone through it themselves and has received the comfort of the Lord that puts flesh on the bones of that comfort. Think of it this way. Every, every single married person can be taught about marriage by a single person. I believe that. I can be taught about marriage from someone who's single. They can take God's word and they can expound God's word on marriage. They can do that. And that's acceptable. An example of that is Paul himself. Paul taught in marriage, but he was single. Now, we don't know. Maybe he was married and his wife left him when he became a Christian. People say it's likely, but we don't know. But what we do know is he was single. He didn't have a success. If he was married, he didn't have a successful marriage because of his faith in Jesus. But he taught a marriage. But there's something three-dimensional about someone who comes with years of experience of marriage and puts flesh on the bones of that teaching. As long as you stick to scripture and you're exegeting scripture correctly, you're breaking it down correctly, you can teach correctly on marriage. 
There's something significant about someone who's gone through it. Parenting, I could open up scripture and teach things about parenting. But there's going to be something much more profound about someone like Matthew teaching on parenting than me. If you've got the gift of comfort, you're probably someone who's gone through a situation that necessitate the receiving of comfort so that which you've received, you are then able to give. And then it says, he who gives with liberality. Everybody is supposed to give. Giving is for everybody. But some people have the gift of giving. What is the difference between someone who gives and someone who has the gift of giving? The answer is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians who've promised to give towards the poor Christians in Jerusalem. But now they seem like they're backing out of it, so Paul's got to put pressure on them because they promised, and through them other people have been encouraged to give. And so as Paul's like, you're not backing out now, you've got to do this thing, guys. And so he's making preparations so that when they come to help them to take that money to Jerusalem, that they'll be ready for it. And he says in verse 10 onwards, I give my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage. You were the first to begin a year ago, not only to do this, but also to desire to do it. Every person who gives is supposed to desire it, right? Don't give if you don't have a desire to give because God's not going to respect that. He's not going to honor that. You give with a conviction to give. And you give because you desire to bless and be a blessing, not to get something from God. But then he says, but now finish doing it also. You started it, now you finish it. Um, so that just as there was the readiness to desire it, so there may also be the completion of it by your ability. Those are the two things that we need if we, when we give. Desire, readiness, and ability. Look what he says in verse 12. For if the readiness is present, so if you've got a desire to do it and you're ready to do it, if, then your gift is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. When you're in a situation that the pastor is putting pr pressure on you and saying, no, you must give. If you want to be blessed, you must give. And you're like, but I can't afford to give this. I've got kids. I've got bills to pay. I, you know, and, you, and you give reluctantly. God's not going to accept that. You've given under duress. And if you've given what you don't have to give, then it's not acceptable. Except if you have the gift of, faith, of, the, uh, the gift of giving. Look at the beginning of that chapter, verses 1 to 3. Now, brethren, we wish, make, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, and look at verse 4, begging us with much urging, urging for the favor of participation and the support of the saints. They couldn't afford to give. And they begged Paul, please let us give. And what's that say? Paul was turning around to them saying, you can't, guys can't afford this. Don't do this. And they say, no, no, please, we, need, we want to be part of this. But you can't afford. The person who has the gift of giving has 50 rand in their pocket and they've got to go and pay a bill for someone. <laughs> well, they've got to pay a bill in their house with that 50 rand. But God says to them, no, you need to give that 50 rand to the other person. And they have the faith and they go and do it and God meets their need through another way. That's the gift of giving that even beyond your ability, you still give. That is the gift. That's not for everybody. Now, it's potentially for everybody, as the Holy Spirit wills. The Holy Spirit can do that to each one of us. But here's the thing. Just because the Holy Spirit does that in me, and I experience God's breakthrough, and God meeting my need, doesn't give me license to turn, into, turn it into a law and tell everybody, if you want to be blessed and you want God to meet your needs, you do this. No, give your last 50 round. No, if you have the gift. When you have the gift of giving, 
you do it with liberality. That word can mean two things. It can mean generosity or it can mean simplicity. Simplicity doesn't mean simple-mindedness. Simplicity means with one purpose and no ulterior motive. That's what simplicity means. It means a wholehearted commitment and devotion to the thing you're doing or believing in. That's what simplicity means. Do it with liberality. In other words, not for any other reason than to be the blessing that God wants you to be. He who leads with diligence, that is the person who stands before. He is the leader. Paul uses the same term to speak of um, leaders in the churches being elders in 1 Timothy 5 verse 17. It's an eldership ministry. And we've looked at elders. So you can look at that on YouTube. I'm relating you to all the other teachings that we've done. But look at this. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. That word mercy there means that you do something that brings benefit and it's resulted from your compassion on someone who's going through distress or sickness or some kind of need. In their need, God works in you and through you, you become a blessing to the person in dire straits or the person who's broken hearted or the person who's sick. Mercy and compassion. It's interesting, Jesus said, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. And he's quoting from the Old Testament. Um, mercy. We need these gifts. Do you notice something about these gifts? And then we'll quickly look at 1 Corinthians 12. Okay. Prophecy, speaking, service, doing, teaching, speaking, exhorting, speaking, giving, act, action. Liber um, leading is both action but teaching speaking and then mercy what you do so it's speak do speak speak do speak do there's something about that when the high priest was that um had to wear his gar his garments at the bottom of his garments were pomegranates and bells and it would be bell pomegranate bell pomegranate bell pomegranate bell pomegranate the bell makes a voice hebrew word kol which means voice or sound it means both the bell makes noise the pomegranate is fruit voice fruit voice fruit voice fruit voice action voice action voice action do you see how all these gifts are impor so important if we only focus on teaching or the speaking ones we're going to deprive the body of that which is going to really build it up because it has to be built up in a multi-dimensional sense. So quickly, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12. There are nine gifts written in 1 Corinthians 12. And, and, and 1 Corinthians 12, the way he's put those gifts together shows us that one, gifts, one gift necessitates other gifts, at least one other gift or some other gifts. So the first two gifts that are mentioned here in verse in verse 8, it says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. These two belong together. The gift of wisdom is, the, the, the gift of, of, of the word of wisdom literally is the gift of communicating wisdom. Logos means the communication in this context. And so, God gives you an ability to communicate wisdom. This can happen in two ways. It happened with Solomon. Remember the two women came before him and um, they said, this one is my baby. No, this one is my baby. And Paul, Solomon says, well, bring a sword, divide it in half. You can have this half and the, you can have that half. And that solved the problem. And the, and the mother turns around and says, no, no, give the baby to her. It's her baby. And then Solomon knew that one's the mother. He got that, he was able to do that after he prayed to God for wisdom. The gift of communicating wisdom to bring about a result. Applying God, the knowledge that God gives you and he gives the ability to speak in such a way that it brings wisdom into a situation. But there's a second way. And Paul does this in his ministry and we've had it in recent terms in the ministry of a guy called Art Katz. He had an ability to communicate things that belong to the depths of God, things that you don't normally think of, and he takes your mind 
and helps you to see things in God's working according to his character as shown in the word where you're digging deeper into God himself and you're seeing how this aspect of God is related to this experience in your life and related to that thing in the word of God and he brings it together and he's communicating the wisdom of God God's mysteries but then there's the word of knowledge or communication of knowledge meaning two things firstly Think of um, when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit and Peter said, you're lying to the Holy Spirit. How did he know that? The Holy Spirit gave him the communication of that knowledge. But in this context, it's more likely to be the communication of knowledge itself. How am I going to communicate? How am I going to unfold the God's scripture and give you the knowledge of scripture unless God enables me to communicate in such a way that you can understand? Those two gifts belong to each other. If you have no knowledge, there's no wisdom because there's no knowledge to apply. You need knowledge and wisdom. They work together. Look at this. Faith comes next. The gift of faith goes with the gift of healing and even the gift, all the other gifts. They go together. An example of that is in Acts chapter, I think it's Acts chapter 13. Was it chapter 13? No, Acts chapter 14 verse 9. And it says, This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he, that is Paul, had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he leapt up and began to walk. He'd been lame from his mother's womb. He's never walked, to the, uh, he's never walked in his entire life. And Paul looks and he sees and he perceives in him, this guy has faith to be healed. Faith is not something you can work up. It's a gift of God. Therefore, the gift of faith is there and the gift of healing is there. Faith, all faith is a gift of God. All faith is a gift of God. Sometimes you will believe for something and you know God is going to do this thing and everybody else is suspicious and thinks, nah, it can't happen. You have the faith for it. It doesn't make you superior to those other people. I, I believe they, they just lacked in belief. No, your faith was a gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit just happened to choose you at that time to be the one to believe it and to tell everybody else about it so that God may be glorified. Faith, gifts of healing. Healing is not praying to God and saying, God, will you heal? And then the person's healed. The gift of healing is when the Holy Spirit so works you, you go up to a person and you would say to them, Jesus Christ heals you, or be healed in Jesus' name, and that person is healed. You have to know the Holy Spirit is leading you, because you say, be healed in Jesus' name, and that person is not healed. That's not the gift of healing. It's a grace of God. A big problem we have and is that we forget what it says that in verse 11 but one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually just as he wills just because god manifests the gift of healing in you doesn't mean you have a right to start a healing ministry it is the gift and the manifestation of the spirit as we read in verse 7 to another the effecting of miracles literally the effective working of powers the effective working of power, what does that mean? It means this. When you so do something in the body, and I know I'm going through this quickly because I'm looking at time, but when you do something in the body and it has an effect and it changes life, that is not you changing someone's life. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit working through you, effecting a change in someone's life, that powerful working of God. Notice Paul says in Romans 1 verses 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. That means if people believe and they get saved, that is the power, the dynamis of God. 
working in those people's life because they've responded in faith to God. And so on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people get saved. That's the gift of the effective working of powers, miracles. Every, every salvation is a miracle of God, a supernatural working of God. So those gifts belong to each other, including also the gift of prophecy and, it says in verse 10, the distinguishing of spirits. Those two gifts go together. You cannot have someone standing up and saying, I believe the Holy Spirit saying this or the Holy Spirit saying this without the discerning of spirits operating. <laughs> if you only have prophecy but not the discerning of gifts, of, of spirits, sorry, you're going to follow any old thing that comes your way. The, the, the gift of prophecy is necessary because we need to know what God is requiring of us this time. We need to be seeking the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you, what do you see saying to us? Someone comes forth with prophetic utterance. It's down to the others to test it. And when you test it, it gives you then confidence because when that stands the test, then you know God has spoken. But conversely, if it's not from the Lord, we've been protected. The last two. There's got to be languages and there's got to be interpretation of languages. You can't just get up and say, Shandra, Gyandra, Biandra, Yandra, and stand up and everybody listens to you. And then it was like, what was that about? No interpretation, no understanding. But if someone comes up and gives an interpretation, and then you sat there, and you're like, that's exactly what I did this morning. That's exactly the secret sin I'm keeping secret in myself. Sheesh. Then it builds up the body. What do we see about these gifts? We see, I was liking it to tent strings. The tarpaulin is the tent. The strings are the gifts. And the poles are the ministries that uphold the tent. If you only have one string, you have a flapping tent. If you only major on one gift, the whole congregation is going to be like this. If we only major on prophecy and we're a prophetic church and we're on the cutting edge of prophecy, this prophecy comes in, brr, go there. Then this new prophecy comes in, brr, go the opposite direction. No. The prophecy, the gift of prophecy needs to be tied together with another tent string, the discerning of spirits. Keep it in tension. We need all the gifts if the tent is going to be standing up straight. And notice, I don't know if you've ever put up a big marquee tent. It is hard work. You need a team of guys. Because these guys put, you kind of put it in, but then you pull and pull and pull, and you see those, those poles going this way, and you almost feel that it's going to fall over, but this other slack ropes that are just keeping it and it's just balancing like this so when you come to the other side you've got to pull it tight to get it up straight that's why we need the body because if some things are just too dominant it leans the whole church in this direction we're two people in our cell group one was straight like this she was said what was on her mind, and if she saw a problem with something, she dealt with it. The other person was a peacemaker. She wouldn't deal with anything. And there was a fallout between these two precious ladies. And when we sat down and talked with them, and they gave their story, it's like, yes, I understand what you're saying, and there are things that the Lord does need to work in the other person, but you need that person. You need that person who's a peacemaker because you are too quick off the mark. You too, now it's good to stand for truth, but you need those other qualities. And to the peacemaker, Scripture says we're to be peacemakers, but not at the expense of truth. You need someone who's going to provoke you to make a stand for the faith. 
And so they actually, we said to them, you guys are so good for each other <laughs> because you have strengths that the other person doesn't have and you have weaknesses that need the strength of the other person to hold you in tension. I'm talking biblical tension. I'm not talking compromise here. Biblical tension, holding each other and contributing into one another's lives that which we are missing. So when we meet together in the cell groups and God puts something on your heart, don't be timid to share. Even out of a meeting, God puts it in your heart to go and visit someone. Don't be timid to do it. Seek for the opportunity. If you're not sure if there's going to be an opportunity, go to the person leading the cell group that night or go to Les or whoever's leading the meeting and say, I've got something I'd, uh, it's on my heart, I'd like to share it. Can I share it? And that person, Les might even say, well, tell me what it is. And then he'll say, come, bring it, we need to hear this. Wouldn't it be amazing if what God put on your heart this week, different to all other weeks, is the same thing God put on your heart and the same thing God put on your heart and you all three go to Les and you say, Les, I've got something on my heart. And, you, and Les says, have you guys been talking together about this? That would be amazing. Then you know the Lord is speaking because he uses his body. It's all God's grace. Not one of us is more important than the other. And not one of us is unimportant to the body. We need humility and boldness. We need to understand God's given us a sphere of ministry and a sphere of gifting. But just because God hasn't given me that sphere or that gifting doesn't mean I don't need that gifting. And therefore, how am I going to get that gifting if God hasn't given me the gifting? I've got to receive whatever God is working through that person. I've got to receive it from that person into me. And so I get that gifting not by God giving it to me, but by me being fed and nourished and challenged and encouraged by the person who has that gift. The days of sitting there and getting hooked up to a dr spiritual drip are over. God, hook me up. No. God's saying, I've given, put stuff in you already. You be faithful with what I've given you. And if you're faithful, I will give you more. Be content with what you've been given, but don't be content just to stay there. Receive from the other people in the body that which I've put in them. And that way, the grace that I've given you will grow as you work and as you serve and as you love and as you support one another. Let's pray. Dear Father, we need your spirit. Lord, we are so dependent on you. We think we're more clever than we are. And at the same time, we underestimate your working through us because we say that we can't do anything and God couldn't possibly use us. And then when you do, we get so big-headed thinking it's just like, weren't we amazing to do that thing? And really, it was just your grace. So Lord, I pray you give us a healthy mind, a mind that thinks correctly. Help us to blossom in the ministries and the callings and the giftings that you've given us and not to hold back, but Lord, to give space for other people to minister to us also. Lord, it's not about us. It's about you. And Lord, your grace is sufficient for us. And I believe, Lord, that you will grow as, as we respond to your word because you've promised it in your word. So we can stand on that and we can say amen because the promises of God are yes and amen. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Can you hear his voice in the thunderous rain? His mercy is poured out once again. Nominations for the deserving are called out in vain. No other reason than the sake of his name. His love never ends He's always the same 
Every repentant sinner that calls on his name To them life he brings Not mere existence or things And from his presence the cleansed he now sends I thank you Lord for your endless grace No one's naturally blameless before your face. It's your work within me that's brought me this far. You've kept me to serve you with this grateful heart. Your love never ends. You're always the same. You took this sinner and you made him a saint A vessel of clay Who called out to you that day The call to your service is just from your hands And why can't they see How your grace is free not a ticket for license, but a life free from me Free from our sins The filth and the dirt A cleansing to serve you where your will comes first And why can't they see How your grace is free not a ticket for license, but a life free from me Free from our sin The guilt and the dirt A cleansing to serve you where your will comes first Can you hear his voice in the thunderous rain? His mercy is poured out once again Nominations for the deserving are called out in vain No other reason than the sake of his name No other reason than the sake of his name No other reason than for the sake of his name no